Okay, folks, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Matt Thomas, and this is the USGS Landslide Hazards Program Seminar Series. Uh, for those of you that are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. Uh, we typically wait until the end of the presentation to take questions, but if you are using the chat window, you can submit questions during the talk. We'll just address them at the end. In the meantime, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted when you're not intending to speak. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Mark. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> well, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Kevin Schmidt. Uh, Kevin's worked with the USGS for many years, and his work has been really a hybrid of, of both landslide studies and geologic mapping with, with an emphasis on superficial processes. Um, Kevin received his bachelor's degree from University of California, Berkeley, and his master's and doctorate from University of Washington. So he's, he's squarely in the Tom Dunn, Bill Dietrich, Dave Montgomery, sort of geomorphic diaspora. But Kevin started his, his work with the USGS as an NAGT intern right after undergrad, but he quickly migrated to working with the landslide group as a temporary employee. And, and that's where I met him when we were looking at hydrology of uh, shallow landslides in Hawaii. That was back in the early 90s. And then for his grad studies, when he went back, he examined a, a wide range of topics, but, but they all had something to do with landslides and instability, you know, controls on uh, topographic relief. He worked on the big experimental site at Coos Bay, Oregon, landslide initiation site. And he's well known for his, his root strength work in Oregon as well. Um, he still contributes to landslide studies in his current work, although some of his focuses on geologic mapping. Kevin and I started landslide work on the Big Sur coast well, about two decades ago. Um, and since then, we've, we've done literally thousands of Schmidt hammer tests. And, and the Schmidt hammer is not named for Kevin Schmidt. But anyway, we've used that test a lot. And, and Kevin's going to talk about part of that work here today on the Big Sur coast. Kevin? Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. The, this photo here exemplifies the, the steep, rugged Big Sur landscape with Highway 1 traversing a number of rock slides along the Pacific Ocean. And research here was really carried out with the help of numerous people, and I, I thank them here with Mark Reed being my primary collaborator, and thank you once again, Mark, for the, the nice intro. Now, the landslide activity here is thought to be driven by wet winters, coastal wave attack, and occasional seismic shaking, but the spatial patterns and the types of slope stability do reflect the underlying rock properties. And our goal then was to understand and constrain the location of future landslide activity with respect to the map geology. I'll discuss the regional setting, the rock strength at a variety of spatial scales, and then I'll end the discussion with monitoring at key sites. Problems addressed in this talk are where are the slides, what rocks are conducive to sliding, and how fast are they moving? I'm going to focus on those first two factors of what rocks and varying estimates of their strength. Now, is the sole transportation corridor connecting San Francisco and LA along the coast Damage to Highway 1 is costly, and estimated 33 million visitors a year provide an influx of money to the local economy. Monterey County alone receives an estimated $3 billion a year in tourism revenue. The highway corridor traverses a series of mountain-scale rock slides, the largest with topographic relief up to a kilometer, and thicknesses of tens of meters which have basal slip surfaces, which generally daylight at sea level where there's notable wave action. Another reason we're working here is a bit of a tension between maintaining the roadway on the edge of the continent and concern regarding increased sediment loads into the nearshore environment, such as the Sea Otter Marine Sanctuary. Here we're looking down on an engineered landslide body and side cast that's slowly metering out to the ocean. And it's common to see high concentrations of suspended sediment adjacent to the landslide toes. 
From a geologic perspective, the Big Sur coast makes for a great natural laboratory because of the rugged topography and variety of rocks exposed arising from the transpressive tectonic setting. Compression and rock uplift occurred during comparatively recent geologic time with exhumation rates inferred from thermochronology to be about a millimeter per year over the last two million years. And the greatest topographic relief in the lower 48 states is found within our study area from Cone Peak here down to the Pacific Ocean through Lucia at the Red Star. The plate boundary structures parallel the, the big San Andreas Fault, and they include the San Gregorio Hosgri Faults that more or less skirt the coastline. The area is characterized by right lateral strike slip faults that bound distinctly different rock types. Superimposed on the geologic framework is a relatively high frequency of slide deformation driven by high wave action, rainfall accentuated by these orographic effects of high relief mountains, and the presence of Highway 1 itself. In a study by the California Geological Survey, Wills et al. identified over 1,500 slides along the highway corridor, and the style and frequency of landsliding varies considerably on the coast from deep-seated rock slides to shallow translational features that mobilize into debris flows. This Lucia area here, indicated by the red arrow, was identified by Wills et al. as having a high susceptibility. And the visitors here enjoy a, uh, a reputation of rock slides, and that's accompanied with some adult beverages with scenic ocean views. But that is up until about a week ago when this unique establishment unfortunately burned up in the middle of the night. Zooming into the Lucia area for context, that's a one mile scale bar. We see wills define four qualitative broad categories of activity. The warmer colors are active or historic, the cooler colors, older deformation. In the scheme of crude and environs, most would be classified as generally slow or very slow moving translational rock slides. And while our rock strength data extends over the extensive stretch of Highway 1 shown in the previous slide, our GPS data is within this Lucia stretch of coast. Some of the larger slides are dormant and old, such as this feature, which is eroded and subtle. We see a steep scarp transitioning downslope into a flatter bowl-like deposit. On the other side of the age velocity spectrum, we have numerous slides which are quite active with dynamic deformation features and disrupted vegetation. They generate secondary mass wasting processes of rock falls and debris flows from the larger slide masses. And at peak displacements during wet years, Highway 1 can be transient. Um, some segments are paved weakly and the asphalt stratigraphy can reach many meters in thickness as the engineers attempt to keep the road at grade. Also on the right here, you see a utility cable that's under high tension from the slide displacement deforming the wooden pole in the head scarp. And that was enough deformation to break the pole down at its base. It's subsequently been relocated upslope of the head scarp. After the 98 wet winter, Paul's slide caused problems for road maintenance, but activity was largely constrained to the disturbed area here seen in the photo. In response, Caltrans, the State Department of Transportation responsible for keeping the highway open, installed slope inclinometers, determined that the slip surface was located at about a 10 meter depth and constructed a retaining structure called the Hermitage Wall located here at the intersection of the slide margin and the highway. Well, this wall has been piecemeal failing in uh, uh, since its construction back in 2016. And here we see a close up of the top of the wall where the lateral margin has blown out the wood lagging between the soldier beams. And the slide has also expanded in size such that this road visible in 98 is no longer passable now. 
Caltrans has installed new slope inclinometers. The revised data push that slip surface from 10 meters to over 60 meters in depth. So to better understand where these slides occur and what rock types may be conducive to sliding, we tested the hypothesis that rock strength is influenced by the rock type, the fracture density, unit contacts and weathering extent modulate that deep-seated rock slide susceptibility. The approach is to measure rock strength by various means and evaluate them in the context of map landslides and the map geology, with the goal being to generate hill slope scale strength parameters for subsequent slope stability modeling. Our study area is a subset of the more extensive coast ranges that extend from the Klamath Mountains near the Oregon border to the transverse ranges in Southern California. And although the area is composed of widely differing rock types, there are three main assemblages that exist in the form of quasi-linear belts. And they're here portrayed as a greatly simplified one kilometer wide but over 140 kilometer long geologic strip map that's been rotated roughly parallel to the strike of the regional faults. And there's no quaternary deposits shown on this map here. In green are the marine trench sediments and volcanic rocks of the Franciscan complex. They're scraped off the ocean floor during the assembling of California. And there are two distinct fault bounded subterrains. There's Point Sur subterrain to the north and the Lucia to the south, representing different burial and uplift histories. The predominant Franciscan rocks are variably metamorphosed gray wacky sandstone, highly sheared shale or argillite. Other rocks include volcanic greenstone, serpentine, and minor chert bodies. The outcrops commonly display highly contorted bedding that's so pervasively sheared that structure can't be traced to extent the, uh, the extent of the outcrop. And the term block and matrix or BIM rock is an apt description. It's visually apparent that these materials have divergent strengths. In contrast, the rocks in pink are a belt of Mesozoic, Plutonic, and metamorphic rocks called the Selenian block. These crystalline basement rocks are pretty unique within the coast ranges. Those crystalline rocks are depositionally overlain by the Cretaceous Great Valley sequence, an inland seaway of sediments of turbidites and fan deposits shown in brown. And each of these primary belts of rock are bounded by faults shown by the black lines on the map. As this available mapping by Wills is regional in scale, the map polygons generally embody numerous rock types within a map unit. But that said, to provide a framework within which to collect our rock strength data, we calculated the aerial proportion of the rock type intersecting that 140 kilometers of coastline. We see by far the largest unit is Franciscan formation. Again, it's one geologic unit, but there are multiple rock types within the complex. The next most prevalent are the tonalites and granitics of the Selenian block, followed by the Great Valley sequence sediments, the Selenian Sur series metamorphics, such as marble, Pismo formation sediments, and I broke out the serpentine here separately, but it's really part of Franciscan. Over that same area, we computed the landslide densities as the ratio of the slide area to the total geologic unit area. We see to the south, the Franciscan complex has over half the landscape as a mapped landslide. On the other end of the spectrum, the selenian crystalline block rocks have less than 2% of the areas of map landslide, where the majority of the rock types express landslide densities sort of in the 10 to 20% range. Now, as the slide mapping was carried out at 1 to 24,000 scale, the smaller, shallower landslides that may be associated with debris flows really are well represented in the data. Rather, it inherently represents the larger rock slides. So to ascertain the intact rock strengths of these primary units, 
We used a type L Schmidt hammer, which is a proxy for rock hardness or elasticity. The hammer is a spring controlled plunger where the measurements are of rebound energy arising from a small temporary change in the rock surface from that given force of the hammer. And to ensure that impact energy remains calibrated, we used an anvil here shown on the right to periodically check the baseline values. And no, I don't receive royalties from the sales of this instrument, as Mark noted. It was designed by a Swiss engineer, Ernst Schmidt, back in the 1950s. Uh, efforts were made here to constrain estimates to relatively intact and unweathered rock, such that the relative peak strengths could be uniformly compared in order to identify that inherently weak material that may be conducive to forming landslide sl slip surfaces. We measured over 70 outcrops between 12 different rock types with thousands of measurements. While the Schmidt hammers were recorded in situ on available outcrops, the point load strength index tests were carried out on samples extracted from characteristic outcrops. And those measurements are really a proxy for uniaxial compressive strength. Those were done from 24 outcrops in 11 different rock types with over 500 measurements. First, here are some example Schmidt hammer results. Uh, again, the measurements were taken on unweathered intact rock, orienting the hammer roughly normal to the outcrop surface. The plots on the right show examples from the Franciscan complex. And those outcrops may be composed of just one type of rock, such as gray wacky sandstone, with just one population seen on the upper right, or outcrops more typically exhibit a spectrum with distinct populations of inherently mixed character, revealing both strong and weak material, and the weak material here being the argillite shale. This data provides a proxy for rock hardness, but the values are really influenced by surface effects such as small fractures and chemical weathering. As such, we also gathered point load data to assess the more integrated intact rock strength. The test requires minimal sample prep and it's relatively rapid and easy to perform. They're basically subjecting a rock to increasingly concentrated loads that are measured by a hydraulic pressure gauge until failure occurs by splitting the rock specimens. The photo here depicts examples of an untested hand sample, as well as a tested sample below showing the whitish pulverized rock that was visually crushed by these, these platen points here. Samples were obtained from the outcrops, not from idealized drill cores, hence the hand samples were trimmed to approximate equal dimensions. We followed the ASTM standards for the testing procedure. The, the strength index is equal to the applied load at failure P divided by the square of the distance or the diameter between the platen points. And to ameliorate issues concerning the shape and size effects of testing irregular hand samples off an outcrop, we applied two corrections. First, the shape correction determines the equivalent core diameter as the minimum cross-sectional area for the fracture across the platen points. And then there's a size correction. And ultimately, the, the strength is related to, to the inverse square of the sample diameter. So we used a size correction computed from the sample data itself over a range of loads of the testing apparatus and that equivalent core diameter there. And here are the, the combined results. Uh, these are main, mean and standard deviations of the Schmidt hammer values in R, representing the rock hardness and the point load values for uniaxial compressive strength in megapascals for all 70 plus sites. And we see a fairly robust relation between the two approaches here to quantify those intactive rock properties. And the linear and the exponential regressions have similar goodness of fits, 
but the greater concavity and non-zero starting value of the exponential fit here is, is preferred. Now, if we take the same data and relate it back to the geologic units, which are here color-coded for, for clarity of grouping by rock types, we see the strong material is sandstone of the Franciscan complex, plutonic and metamorphic rocks of the Sublinian block, and the Great Valley sequence sediments are, are surprisingly strong here. The weak material primarily being that argillite or shale. Here's an example of that in the tidal zone. This image on the right was one of the more, more coherent argillite outcrops tested. Most were very mechanically weak and a challenge to test. And these values again represent the intact rock strengths, but to understand the bulk properties of the entire rock mass, such as seen in the photo example here, we really need to incorporate the influence of the intervening discontinuities and beds. And such information was collected by measuring the spacing and character along tapes strung out on the outcrop or scan lines. Now, there are many classification schemes available to semi-quantitatively describe the broader strength of rock and those intervening discontinuities, and they all share kind of similar traits. We applied three schemes, and they're listed here in increasing order of complexity. They are rock quality designation, or RQD, and that's simply the discontinuity, discontinuity frequency, really nothing more. The geological strength index, or GSI, is based on intact rock blockiness and the joint surface condition. And lastly, rock mass strength, or RMS estimates, are based on seven factors that were designed for application specifically to rock slide susceptibility. And such field information is really critical because of the mismatch and scale between our estimates of intact rock strength and the effective landscape scale strength of the overall rock mass. Even in lab settings, it's practically impossible to determine representative strengths by direct testing because small samples represent only a fraction of the hill slope scale rock mass characteristics. For each approach here, the tape and compass scan line technique was extended over two or three dimensions to estimate volumetric characteristics. Looking at the RQD here, it was developed by a uh, pioneer in rock mechanics, Don Deere, back in 1964. It's a standard in core logging and forms a basic element of almost all of the rock mass classification schemes. The metric is simply the recovery percentage of rock chunks, either in a drill core or a scan line, that exceed a threshold of 10 centimeters in length. And the example on the right here is for an RQD value of about 55, just to get your brain calibrated. We painstakingly measured discontinuities along tapes or scan lines as kind of depicted in the photo here. Their macro to meso scale that is observable by the naked eye at a distance of about a half a meter away from the outcrop. Hence, the micro cracks generated at low confining stresses at the ground surface were not included. And the box and whisker distributions that we see on the left represent the median and the quartile values for the greater than 70 outcrops on what we deem to be stable ground. That is not from landslide bodies where the rock masses have undergone additional disruption and strain besides the tectonics. The Franciscan rocks have some of the lowest values of RQD, the weak units being the argillite and the serpentine. The Sur series metamorphics also had few longer intact rock pieces in the outcrops. Examples of moderately coherent rock include the greenstone and the gray wacky. The most intact rocks, though, were the crystalline granitics and tonalites of the selenium block rocks with few fractures, and also the Cretaceous Great Valley and Pismo Formation sediments were fairly intact. 
Now, discontinuity frequency alone is diagnostic, but it inherently has no added information about more comprehensive mass strength characteristics. So we also used the GSI to integrate lithology, rock blockiness, and joint condition. And it too is descriptive and largely qualitative, but it's widely accepted tool for estimating strengths of heavily jointed rock masses. And it's a necessary input into the Hoke and Brown failure criterion, which it can be used to estimate geotechnical properties, which I'll show in a couple slides. The GSI is also supported by lab analyses of the rock deformation modulus E. And we can also show here how the disturbance factor at the ground surface decreases the measured values of that deformation modulus. So what is the GSI? It was um, essentially at the heart of it is a careful engineering geology description from visual examination of rock blockiness in rows and joint surface condition in columns with the arrows pointing towards increased tectonic de deformation. The original GSI classification system was extended to include even poorer quality rock masses, such as those present in our field area. And even so, it can be a challenge to apply in really disturbed uh, rock masses typical of the tectonic framework that we have, where there's little primary fabric and the characteristics vary over different spatial scales. The scheme is best suited for material where failure occurs along pre-existing discontinuities, that is minimal induced failure of previously intact rock. And we're using GSI estimates from the outcrops with our constraints on the intact rock strength to then plug those into the Hook and Brown failure criterion to calculate values of friction angle and cohesion. The nonlinear Hook and Brown failure criterion has been uh, put into a program called RS Data. And in its simplest form, this is an empirical stress surface that's based upon Griffith crack theory used in geomechanics to predict when the rock fails. Sigma 1 and Sigma 3 are the principal stresses. Sigma CI is the unconfined compressive strength. And values for a petrographic constant, M sub I, relate the compressive strength properties of different lithologies that we can estimate from our point load tests as well as the deformation modulus. The software was initially designed for high overburden stresses of underground excavations in hard, competent rock, think mining applications. But more recent refinements include the downgrading of Sigma CI and the Epsom I values for more punky near surface rock masses. And again, we used outcrop estimates of the GSI and we maxed out the disturbance factor at one here to sort of represent low stress near surface environments. We used a uniform slope height of 100 meters chosen to represent sort of general hill slope relief providing the topographic stress. And here are the re results in that we see the uh, tonalites and granites and some of the greenstones show the strongest material with friction angles exceeding 45 degrees and cohesions about 0.4 on up, that is 0.4 megapascals. The Cretaceous sediments express an intermediate range. The strong Franciscan rocks demonstrate a wide range of values. And the visibly weak serpentine and argillite of the Franciscan formation have uniformly low friction angles, less than 20 degrees, and cohesions less than about a tenth of a megapascal. So the lessons learned here, the Franciscan complex rocks exhibit the widest range in friction angles and cohesions, but they consistently exhibit the weakest material. 
Again, these rock strengths depict uh, the parent material devoid of landslide strain. And although we haven't pursued it yet, these geotech properties can be used as inputs to slope stability modeling, such as Mark Scoops 3D, to evaluate slide susceptibility with respect to the underlying geology in different topographic settings and with local rainfall records. Now, the, the, the GSI estimates were necessary to calculate those values of friction angle and cohesion, but the framework's pretty generic. That is, it focuses on just the two factors of the rock blockiness and the joint surface condition. In order to tailor our evaluation of the mass strength specifically to deep-seated rock slide susceptibility, we also applied this RMS scheme using our intact rock strength estimates, but placing those intervening discontinuities in a much broader context. Here, there's seven weighted outcrop scale properties that are estimated from field observations, pretty rapid to collect, little field equipment, and no lab analyses necessary. The seven inputs include strength of the intact rock from the Schmidt hammer, the degree of weathering, the discontinuity spacing back to that RQD metric, and here the orientation relative to the hill slope. This factor has direct bearing on how geologic structure influences local slide susceptibility. In the stream case, consider dip slopes composed of well-bedded rock punctuated by weak materials, such as the gray wacky sandstone argillite shale combinations of the Franciscan complex. This scheme also incorporates discontinuity width, the pervasiveness and infilling with clay, and any outflow of groundwater that was observed at the outcrop. These RMS values were estimated at the over 70 sites with each rock type exposed at an outcrop for both joint sets and for bedding plane discontinuities. And here are the box plot results. A um, similar distribution to the GSI arises with the selenium crystalline rocks expressing high uniform populations. As these plutonic rocks have no bedding planes, they intrinsically can't form unstable dip slopes. The Great Valley sequence sediments are moderately high. Sur series metamorphics express a, a pretty broad range here. For the Franciscan complex rocks, again, high to low. Although the, the point load and Schmidt hammer values display some of the highest intact rock strengths to the Metagabros, Greenstones, and Gray Wackies, those overall rock mass strengths are brought down where the discontinuities are frequent and also where those discontinuities are unfavorably aligned parallel to the topography. And of course, here we have the, the weak material, the argillite and the shale again. If we compare this RMS data to the RQD, the metric that solely represents the, the fracture frequency seen on the right here with the same rock mass data on the right, again, the selenium block rocks exhibit both high RQD and RMS values. The Franciscan greenstone and gray wacky, although they have those intact rock strengths that are high, is moderate fracture spacings bringing down the RMS values. And again, the, R, the RQD values of the argillite and the serpentine really bring down the, those RMS values. Now let's tie the RMS values back to the map landslide densities along the coast. If rock mass strength alone exerts the primary influence on in slide occurrence, one would expect an inverse relation between rock mass strength and slide density. The dashed lines here bracket the general expected relationship. The crystalline basement rocks primarily express high RMS values and are commensurately low landslide densities. The expected relationship of strong rock, low landslide density. 
Conversely, some of the weakest RMS values in the Franciscan correlate with high landslide densities. So why do we see strong rocks here with high landslide densities? That is the greenstone, gray wacky, and metagabro of the Lucia subterrane correlate with some high landslide densities. Now, this could simply be because the Lucia subterrane contains a high volumetric proportion of weak rocks, such as the argillite and serpentine that we've seen. But in this soil mantled, highly vegetated landscape, it's difficult to estimate the relative proportions of these rocks with a strongly bimodal distribution. Besides that bimodal distribution, is there another factor contributing to the high slide densities? Well, let's dig into this a bit more by looking at the two subterranes. Returning to the tectonics of the region and the geologic strip map, the faults bound those accretionary rocks with different burial and uplift histories. To the south, again, we have the Lucia terrain, and it's been shown that those rocks express a higher metamorphic grade as determined by vitronite reflectance studies. This arises from a deeper structural burial followed by differential uplift in a thermal overprint. This higher metamorphic grade is manifest as higher Schmidt hammer measurements. If we compare the same rock types in the two different northern and southern terrains, we see that the southerly rock type uniformly has higher Schmidt hammer values. So some of the higher landslide densities unexpectedly correlate with higher metamorphic grade higher intact rock strengths, and higher rock mass strength values. Now, let's see if the Lucia terrain has a slightly different topographic expression. So to do that, we cookie cuttered the geologic units from a 10 meter DEM to evaluate the potential influence of rock strength on landscape form. Here we see a plot of gradient in a subset of the entire area that closely correlates with the locations of the surf thrust, demonstrating a tight correlation between tectonics, rock type, and topographic form. In the table, the gradients are grouped and color-coded by geologic map unit. To begin with, I'm not gonna separate out those two Franciscan subterrains. I'm gonna put all the Franciscan together and then break it apart piece by piece. To better visualize these tabular relations, let's graphically look at those groupings for the mean and standard deviations of slope. For the quaternary units in yellow, we see the mean slope is uniformly low, except for polygons mapped as landslide or QLS. That's reassuring because the quaternary units are largely depositional on lower gradient topography. And these QLS polygons represent rock slides from the bedrock portion of the landscape, so they really should be steeper. The Cretaceous Great Valley sediments in brown, the crystalline, plutonic, and metamorphic rocks in pink and blue express generally high slopes, hovering at about a mean of, of 30 degree slope. In contrast, the topography composed of the two combined Franciscan subterranes express high slopes in the 30 to 40 degree range for metagabro and greenstone, but also low slopes for incompetent rocks like schist. If we look at this data in the context of frequency to reflect the spatial extents of the map units, we see that the landslides are by far the, the highest grid cell frequency occupying the largest amount of area. The next most frequency is the undifferentiated Franciscan complex with a bit of a positive skew to the slope distribution, followed by the metamorphic and plutonic rocks with an even more positive skew. This plot portrays the distribution of the Franciscan complex polygons lumped together across those two subterranes. Now let's start teasing those apart and weave together the, the threads of rock slide density, rock strength, and topography. 
We have this apparent paradox of high slide densities that correlate with the stronger intact rocks with the higher metamorphic grade. And that I think can be explained at least in part by the steeper topography. Looking at the plot on the right, we see topography of the southern Lucia terrain is clearly steeper than the northern terrain. So the Lucia subterrain is generating some higher uh, topographic driving stresses here. Now, if we take this plot and separate it out a bit more by looking at the, the finest resolution allowed by the geologic maps, we see these box plots, box plots here are grouped by rock type for each terrain such that we see that the steeper southern Lucia terrain is in the darker colors here. And I've separated out the different rock types with these dashed lines. So we've got steeper topography throughout all the different map units here, driving potentially a higher landslide susceptibility. But as I mentioned previously, it's also likely a combination of these topographic stresses with a high volumetric proportion of the weak materials, such as the argillite that contributes to the widespread instability. So some take home messages here, calculated strength parameters cluster with respect to the geologic units, which in turn generally correlate with landslide density and topographic form. The selenium block rocks have the lowest deep-seated landslide densities and exhibit the highest friction angle and cohesion values. And although topography composed of selenium block rocks doesn't express many rock slides, it is prone to shallow slides that mobilize into debris flows. The Cretaceous sediments display characteristics intermediate between those of the selenium plutonic and the Franciscan complex rock masses. And that's structurally heterogeneously Franciscan, exhibiting that block and matrix particle size distribution, displays the highest map landslide densities and consistently the lowest rock strengths, with the weakest units being the argent light and the serpentine. And we see these varying landslide densities in the Franciscan subterranes that likely arises from different metamorphic grade and topographic expression from the different uplift histories. And we see here that the geologic maps can provide a, a means to infer at least a first order spatial distribution of the geotech strength properties across a landscape but a given map unit defined by formation names alone likely encompasses a broad range of rock types and hence strengths. So lastly, to address this paradox of high landslide densities correlating um, with some rocks that are both strong and weak expressing this bimodal distribution, Future 3D modeling could be used to evaluate the critical volumetric proportion of that weak material necessary to destabilize the larger rock mass. And such modeling could be verified with transects along the tidal zone where there's good exposure to extend the observations that I've previously discussed here. And that concludes the rock strength portion of the presentation, but in the remaining time, I'm going to discuss some constraints on slide deformation rates, research led by Mark Reed and Beth Haddon of the USGS. So we used repeat biannual GPS surveys to determine the movement. They have short baseline lengths. We derive differential static solutions with campaign style surveys in the spring and the fall. And here we see the displacement vectors from over 35 monuments depicting the wide range in rates from essentially stable sites to low displacement to slow to moderate to pretty fast. Uh, for context here, here's a one meter scale bar for those vectors. We see the Daney Creek slide 
Uh, the vectors extend for many, many times the height of this graphic for tens of meters of cumulative displacement since we started monitoring. And to provide local um, context for these surveys, we've carried out field mapping of deformed features such as cracks and grobbins and recent repairs or patches to the asphalt strain gauge of a Highway 1. This crack mapping provides a way to put the GPS surveys into a, a kinematic context. We also have been comparing the slide displacement variability over time with precipitation and offshore wave energy estimates. And to define the temporal resolution of the slide displacement, we recently installed a continuously operating GPS in back in October 2020 on the Daney Creek slide. This continues to be an active site where Caltrans installed another retaining wall to keep the road at grade, but this wall essentially decapitated the slide head scarp and the downslope mass continues to march towards the ocean. And since construction, the slide has dropped many meters, exposing the lighter colored concrete at the bottom extent of the wall. And hopefully this continuously operating data will give us a uh, tighter resolution between the rainfall and the displacement and at least gauging from one very dry winter this last season. The response times may be short, raising questions on how water and piezometric response behave in these materials. And to complement the ground-based point measurements of GPS displacements, we also applied SFM or structure for motion techniques to generate a time series of topographic models from both imagery acquired from fixed wing and UAV platforms. This work by Beth Haddon has the benefit of spatially continuous estimates of land surface change. There's really nice high point densities that are constrained by ground control points surveyed again with GPS on stable objects that are readily identified in the imagery. And Bath did a cloud to cloud comparison that reveals a pattern consistent both with our field observations and the GPS measurements. The Daney Creek slide here shown on the, the lower left has a lot of red. That's a lot of surface normal change. That's the site with that new continuously operating GPS. And then Paul's slide here also shows widespread deformation. Looking at Paul's a bit more, she used a particle tracking approach to look at a time series to depict changes in calculated average horizontal and vertical velocities relative to the cumulative precipitation and local stream discharge records here in blue. We see back in 2017 that displacements of Paul's slide correlate with the significant rainfall we had in that year. And that's also when the Mud Creek slide went catastrophic a few miles to the south. And as a reminder, that was the 3 million cubic meter slide that buried Highway 1, constructed a new bit of coastline and cost over $54 million to repair over a year of Caltrans construction. So that's my introduction to the spectrum of USGS research of landslides going on in the Big Sur coast. And I thank you for tuning in today.